we get to this point. So the two papers that we will be discussing mostly, those are actually based on my dissertation. One of them is about control risk assessment. Who knows what control risk assessments are? Yeah, fine with guesses. Okay, yeah. So, control risk assessments, they are basically surveys, questionnaires more or less, where they check how each process and sub-process is. And after SOX, it's not only the management who is supposed to identify those, is uh, to have actually it's not only auditors, it's the auditors. Management has to, yes, go ahead. Yes, yes. So basically you have to assess the internal control system as a whole. This is as external auditor. And you also need to report on the assessment, on the management assessment. So it's not only that the external auditors will have to do it. So basically, companies management have to report on the adequacy of, and the ex uh, of their information systems. External auditors are also supposed to report on the adequacy as well as the management assessment. So this is why it is kind of very it is important to know how this system will work. Is it efficient or not? Is it going to actually prevent certain transactions from happening? Now, what's the trick here? Once again, you have all those locations. This is a project with Procter & Gamble, and they have hundreds and thousands of control risk assessments per year. Not hundreds of thousands, hundreds and thousands, just so that you wouldn't get. But still, to follow up with each one of them, the guy who, with whom we were, the head of the internal audit department at Procter & Gamble, they, he's he, he straightforward told us that they cannot do that. They can actually just invest, look at like five or 10 or 20 maximum, 20 tops. At that point, so we know that external auditors, according basically uh, 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 auditing standard number five, uh, encourages external auditors to take the work of internal auditors into consideration, and they have to also, uh, 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 and SOX requires management to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, external auditors to, to look at uh, the assessment or to evaluate the assessment of the ma of management uh, to control uh, to the internal control system. But if you can only look at 20, what about the remain remaining cases? You're still taking a sample. And what did we say about sampling? We don't like it. Do we? No, no, come on, come on, say, do you guys like sampling, yes or no? Well, you know what they say about statistics, right? There are, and God help me if there is someone here who is a statistician. They say that there are uh, big lies, there are white lies, and then uh, there are white lies, there are big lies, and then there is statistics. <laughs> so it's to that point. But the idea is that sampling is not always going to find those exceptions. Now, control risk assessments involve something very interesting that would make those exceptions in numerous. What is that? What do you need to use when you are evaluating the control risk? Your, you're, you're expected to always use your brain, Yahoo. So it's not just for, for this one, your judgment. So it's not just brain. You're supposed to do that all the time. <laughs> Unless you're a zombie, are you? <laughs> then you would be eating brains, but no. Not, well, you will be still using them, but for a different thing, as food. <laughs> so, yes, you will be using your judgment. And my judgment may be different from Tiffany's judgment, right? There is subjectivity here. It's, there is, it's not like objective. It's not always black and white. Extreme cases are 
easy to basically agree on. Uh, basically, you easily agree on a very bad case or a very good one. So a very good system or a very weak system. You agree on that one. It's the problem always is in the middle. So are you going to consider it as basically medium or high? So between high and low, it's very unlikely that it would happen. Okay, so now we talked about this, so let's skip. Blah, 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 okay. So, now this study was a simple one. It was actually, we were approached by Procter & Gamble's internal audit department. They gave us a data set with, where they had identified issues with the control system of business uh, of sub-processes. So they, what they happen is that they would go to a location. Auditors, for example, they go visit a location, say New Jersey. They look at each process, each business process separately. For example, they can look at IT or they can look at manufacturing. And then they look at all the sub-processes underneath that. They identify any control issues with those sub-processes. Let's say IT, so for example, they find that IT applications are good, IT security is weak, so they find those issues with IT security and issues that are associated with IT applications, I network, etc. and then they combine this information in their mind, they use their judgment, to provide a risk level of IT or of manufacturing for that specific location. Did I guys lose you here or did you, un did you understand how this data uh, basically, how, how it was generated? Those control risk assessments are like surveys. The company, would, the auditors would go and you will see between all BO. What does BO mean? Business owner, basically. So because there were two sets, two data sets, but they are ex very similar. So the idea here was that you have those auditors. Let's talk about internal auditors. They go to a location. They examine the business processes, different business processes at certain location. They identify all the issues that are uh, that they find for each sub-process, and they categorize those issues as critical, major, or non-major. So they have three categories, uh, three classes, three categories of issues. Unfortunately, we don't have access to those issues for privacy concerns. They did not share that information with us, but they tell us, for example, that. With IT security, we found two major issues. That was the data. They will tell you that you had two major issues with that, uh, uh, with that sub-process. And then they use their judgment to give an overall risk level, low, medium, or high, for that business process at that location. Okay. you would expect that this would be more or less systematic because they, if they have found the same issues, you expect them to use the same, to basically use the same or come up with the same um, risk level, right? Wrong. It was around 25% of the cases, they were different. So at that point we said, it doesn't make any sense to have like 25% of the cases where the auditors they don't agree uh, with the expected value. So the next step was for us to see how far off the auditor's judgment was from the expected value. So the data that we had access to was this one here. So we had those issues and so we had those issues, and we had the overall risk assessment for each business process. Okay, is that clear so far? 
We had that information, so we were able to use ordered logistic regression to basically come up with an expected value. Now, this is the breakdown of the data. Control risk assessment, it means this is done by internal auditors. Control risk self-assessment, it is done by business owners. So you have here the control risk self-assessment. Those are the same kind of surveys that are used by the business owners, by management of that location to evaluate their own, to evaluate their own controls and to see how they are doing. Yes. Oh, those are audit plans. Audit plans is this audit risk here, the risk level that is here, which is by business process by location. So we have, those are, it means when you have 924, it means we have 924 risk level for individual processes at certain locations. Low risk, low is low risk. Medium is medium risk and high is high risk. This is not a value. This is the number of, audit of, of different audit plans that they have. Which one, the 924? No, the 924 is simply, th there, are, there are three risk levels, low, medium, and high. But you have 924, think about it as cases, at business processes. So that each one would be a business process at certain locations. So those 924, it could be, for example, IT at, uh, I don't know, Newark. Another one would be, another one would be, for example, manufacturing. I have bad handwriting, so just deal with it. Don't you dare say anything like uh, about it. Internal auditors is the internal audit department. They are using the same questionnaire, but one of them is done by internal auditors. The other one is self-evaluation by the man by. There's a, a whole list of control checks. We are not privy to that. This is what I'm, t this is, so like, look, here. No, it's not department, it's processes. No, it's a process of business processes, 900, but, uh, of, pro of business process wi with control, so where they looked at the controls related to their sub-processes. So this is 924, looking at, and each one would be, let's say, not like manufacturing, et cetera, so it would be manufacturing in New Brunswick. So if they have a manufacturing plan, it would be manufacturing in New Brunswick. It could be another one would be basically IT in Newark. Yes. Why do you think is that? Because in the same questionnaire, this one is simply the control risk self-assessment is simply done more often. Well, the thing is that this is not all at once. You see? Yes. So the thing is that those internal auditors, they cannot actually, uh, they don't visit, they do surprise audits, et cetera, but they're usually, their periodic audits for those ones are like every six months, et cetera. Control risk self-assessments, they do it more often. Why? They are there. So they just take this one and they check it. And they started actually with control risk self-assessments in 2008. So that was an interesting thing. It used to be by done by internal auditors and then they introduced the control risk self-assessment where business owners, they themselves, they try to evaluate it. Yes. How many persons? It depends on each location. How many process, I, what do you mean?
They are all assigned. Those are all assigned ones. No, those are done. Those are have already happened, and they already. This is one of the advantages of this data set is that we have the outcome. We know what the risk level that was assigned by the auditors is. What we're trying to do is to look at it collectively. What are the auditors in general? So for example, let's take a case where a case where there the sub processes of a certain process. So process business process one had two major issues with their sub processes. Remember that the business process, the risk level, looks at all the sub processes and all the issues associated with that sub with these sub processes. So let's look here at IT. They had two major issues with security and one non major issue with applications. Okay? And auditors, oh, it's moved. And the auditors at this point gave this process a medium risk. Called it medium risk. Now, they also have found in another case, another auditor looked at a situation where they had two major issues and one and one non-major issue. You would expect to also have that, that business process to have a medium risk, right? At that point, the auditor made it or assigned a high risk. Why? But this is, this is the thing. What they do is they look at, this is correct. The problem is that they look at all those processes. And this at this point, based on what they told us, what they do is they give, more or less in their mind, a score for each one of those major issues. And a score for each one of the non-major issues. And remember, there is an auditor judgment here. And we are not saying that the auditor is wrong. We're simply saying that, okay, so based on what the majority of auditors did, you expect the level to be medium risk. All of a sudden you see that the actual one that was assigned was a high risk. We're not saying that the auditor is mistaken. We're simply saying that it's different from the expected value. Please explain why. It could be at that point that you would say that, okay, that business process had only two uh, two issues and they were both, uh, two sub processes and they had, both of those controls had issues compared to one where they had 10, co uh, ten uh, controls and only two of them were wrong, right? So at this point, you're just asking for explanation. You will see later on how it happens. It's not black and white. And in most cases, it is on the borderline. This is the part on the, of the in the middle. So it's not the high risk and the low risk. It's between medium risk and high risk and between medium risk and low risk. This is the gray area. This is where you're not sure. So most of the time, whenever you have a critical issue, that's automatically high risk. If you only have a non-major issue, that's automatically a low risk. Okay, what, we had three cases actually when, where we had zero issues. Zero issues. What do you expect? the risk level to be? No. Basically, they didn't find any issue with that uh, business process. Well, it was actually high risk. So we asked them, what were these, why were these high risk? The auditors did not know. They had to investigate it. They went back and they investigated it. And what did they find out? Those were fraud issues. They were connected to a fraud case. As a result, the fraud division, Procter & Gamble, removed all the information because they were investigating it. So they actually removed all traces of it. And we had 
no information that this was like that. Let's say that you are the external auditor and you are evaluating, you are reporting on the management's assessment of control risk. Wouldn't you want to know that there was a certain ca three cases where there were issues? Whether they investigated them or not, this is a totally different thing, but they were issues. Don't you want to know this? Wouldn't you want to know this information? If you were simply sampling, you were most likely, you would have missed this information. You wouldn't have found that there were three cases of fraud. This is what we're simply saying. Do you guys get this data set or now for now, let's move on. I'll tell, we'll see in a second. So we use ordered logistic regression. Simply, it simply said this ordered logistic regression is a probabilistic model. I don't expect you to understand exactly, and this is not my point. I don't care if you understand exactly how it happened. The big idea here is that this approach allows us to actually find the predicted probability of each case. So each one of these, each one of these, you can look at it and see what the probability of this case being high risk, the probability of that case being medium risk or low risk based on the underlying issues that were identified. So let's say, again, based on the two major issues and one non-major issue, what, what is the predicted probability of this business process being low risk, medium risk, or high risk? So it doesn't give you just a class. It gives you the predicted probability for each one of them. And why do we want to do that? Because this would allow us to see how far off the auditors judgment was from the expected value. So in many cases, you would see that it was very close. At that point, although it is an exception, but you as head of internal department or as external auditor who is trying to look or evaluate the work of the other departments, you can simply ignore it. Because you see that, okay, so it was very close to the expected value. It's still different, but it's okay. You will see now what what I mean by that? Do you have a question? Well, this is the thing. The only way between the issues that you know is that whether they are critical, major, or non-major. You don't have any additional information. They don't give us. So we try to get the actual issues to see the severity. And at that point, to look at, for example, like what Yehuda men said, to look actually how many processes, how many, basically how many controls are there for each process, we don't have this information. So we're doing whatever we have, and we're trying to see, okay, basically what we know is that the auditor's judgment of the risk level of each process is a function of the underlying issues that they have discovered, right? Isn't it? Okay to assume that, that why are they saying that this business process is medium risk or high risk? It is because they identified certain issues related to the sub-processes of that process and that location. So we, this is the assumption that it is a function of those issues that they have identified. Yes. You should, but this is uh, this is the thing. This is the model, generally speaking. This is the model in general, because at that point, we don't know what, whether uh, don't you need also to test the null hypothesis? What if all these are useless? Then it doesn't matter, right? Don't you want to see whether your whether your variables, which are the classes of critical, the number of critical issues, uh, major issues and non-major issues, whether they do add value or not. There will always be a relationship between 
You mean why isn't it just a zero? That's that's this one is the general. This one is the general. Basically, this one until here. This is the general. Yeah, I made the mess here. This is the general logit model. Well, that was which w w where we found that, for example, you have three cases with zero, but still. You see, in certain cases, they might find something, and this is what the internal audit basically guy told us. This is the internal auditor told us that in certain cases they know um, they find a small issue, but they don't report it. So it could be an under documentation, but there is something there because certain cases you have like zero, and yet they assign a certain risk level. Then why? Maybe they found something that they don't want to say that it's it's very it's really a major issue or a even non-major issue. But at the same time, they did not they simply ignore to mention it. But they thought that it's different. In certain cases, it was the other way around, where you would have they cut them some slack maybe. So they have they know that the management are trying to do something. And again, this is their explanation to the auditor. As far as we are concerned, we're simply saying that, okay, we're using the same information that was provided to the auditors as evaluators. Because remember, maybe when you were there, the auditor who is actually doing the test, they know other stuff. But the head of the internal audit department, they don't know. If they weren't with them, they have to look at the papers that they have documented. So at this point, if there's any under documentation, it has to. It will. It has to be. Basically, it has to be shown why. Yes. It could be. There. There is always some kind of risk that that you might have missed something. So this is part of why you always include it. And we did find actually. I don't include the values here. We had the intercepts calculated for each one of them. I can't remember them, of course, because like we had several models. We did. We used something called the sliding window technique. Sliding window technique, it simply starts with rather than just doing. So the main model that we tested here was using the first two years. Those years were to train the model. We used this as historic data. And then the testing data, we use this one here. That they, ha if we had no outliers at all, I would have assumed that they are doing things systematically, completely systematically, and at that point there is little judgment used. And, and the second part, and the second part, so the judgment, all the judgment would have been here, but not at this point. Here you would have no judgment. It would have been a systematic thing. You found the uh, uh, controls, it's automatically, it would automatically give you, you find the issues with the controls, you automatically get the risk level. But that was not the case. There's always judgment used uh, after they identify certain issues. At that point, if, if my if my model has captured everything that they have, then yeah, it could. There are exceptions. I'm defining the exception in that it is different. The exceptions at that point, you will. The exception at that point would be any case that does not that the probability of being, let's say, high risk, but the auditors assigned it as a low as medium risk. That would be an exception. That's my definition. Yeah. We don't have ten thousand exceptions, but we. Why 
why? We did, we did find a lot of cases where there was, where there was a, basically like zero, zero issues and still you would have high risk. No, based on them, they said that they didn't, when you have zero issues, Michael, it simply means that they didn't find any problems with the process. Then why is it high risk? They didn't find any issues with No, no, it's not my prediction. It simply means that they have, the auditors, they did not find any issues associated with that business process and yet, Okay. Oops. But that's But that's not what I'm trying to see. No, well, I'm not trying Well, I'm not trying to see Yes. Yes, but it doesn't, it's not always systematic. But it's not always systematic. That's the point. No, it's, it's not always systematic. If it were systematic, I would have had, every time that you would have three major issues, for example, you would automatically have a, ma a high risk. But that's not the case. This is, yes, this is another layer of check. What? At that point, Dave was telling us, for example, that they cannot look at all these cases where they are not, that they are not uh, the same as the model. And it did turn out to be that there were certain cases that were suspicious. When you have, tw when you have according to them, when you have like 25% of 10,000s, which was the case, 25% of 10,000 that are different, although not all, not all of them are, you have 10,000 here, this one here. Both of them. Well, the risk assessment or control risk self-assessment, even with the, with the other one, it's still like 260 something. So if you talk about 250 cases where the auditor's judgment was not according to the expected value of my model. Yeah, I know that it's of my model, but still. So it, it simply means that it's not systematic. If it were systematic, you would have the same all the time. You would have captured all of them, but at that point you did not. Yes. Basically, the, yeah, basically, the objective here was that to see if the auditor's judgment, if they systematically assigned risk levels based on identified issues. Did they do it systematically or did they use their judgment? And if they use their judgment, this is a tool to evaluate that judgment. If there was a consistency all the time, that means they, they're, they would have had the same thing. Now. I don't know, maybe if I give you an example, it will make it e clearer. So, and at this point, you have, this is an actual record. That record, sorry, that record had zero critical issues count. So CC stands for critical issues count, the count of critical issues. So this is, major issues and this is non-major issues. Now, whenever you have using the ordered logistic regression model, whenever you have a case with two major issues and three non-major issues, there is a probability, there is a 60.7% probability that this case will be a high risk. What simply this means is that 60% of the time, 
uh, the auditors will assign a case like that a high risk level. On the other hand, the same case, 39.2% of the time, auditors would give it a low risk. Yes, a, a medium risk, sorry. Certain auditors would assign it as high risk. Certain auditors would assign it as medium risk. At this point, 60% of the cases, it's assigned as high risk. Almost 40% is, or 39% is medium risk. And at that point, we're not saying that the auditors are wrong or right. So this is basically to go back to what Yehuda said earlier. What if they had only two to uh, processes and they, they, I'm sorry, two controls and they had issues, both of them, or something like that. So this is something where the auditors have used their judgment. So the auditors, go ahead. Yes. That's true, but we don't have it. That's the thing, we don't have it. And in many cases, external auditors, they won't have it unless they actually request to, uh, to examine each one of these control risk assessments or control risk self-assessments, which is not the case. They cannot evaluate, so the best way would be to actually ask them for each one of these cases and to look at it, but they cannot do that. It's not possible. Yes, definitely. Oh, this is the thing. The, I'm not saying this is the point. I'm not saying at this case in this case that the expected value is the correct one and the auditor is mistaken. That's not what we claim to do. What we're saying is that simply, that this is not what the majority of auditors gave for a case similar to this one. So in this case, we found, we actually found that, we actually found that the auditors assigned, a K assigned this one a medium risk. The auditors, they used this information here to say that this case is a medium risk. What? This is showing judgment. It's not that I want it to be incorrect. Then you don't need their judgment. You can automate it, actually. At that point, you can simply automate it. This is true. So we're not trying to say that they are wrong. We're simply saying that this is different from what the majority of auditors said. This is different from the majority of the cases. The majority of the cases would say that this is supposed to be a high risk case. Then why is it not a high risk? At that, yes, Charles. Yeah, I'm going to, yeah. So basically, in this case, the predicted value, it simply says that this is where the, it is the highest likelihood that it would be uh, given, uh, for example, in this case, the calculated probability, the predicted probability for high risk is 60% of the times, which is, it simply says that it's most likely going to be a high risk case. Because 60% of the times, the auditors would give it a high risk. Then at that time, at that point, you're simply saying that this case is most likely going to be a high risk case. Again, it does not mean that there is something that the auditors made a mistake. It could be that the auditors, they saw that the management were actually implementing something to fix that issue already, or they have started already, or that they have, uh, Im basically they are aware of the situation and they're trying to fix it. Maybe they cut, cut them some slack and they gave them a medium risk. Or maybe that case had I don't know, it had, for example, that business process had like 
20 controls. At that point, two of them, it's fine. It's not an issue compared to, for example, one that where they only had three or four. Yes? Wh which one? There is always a likelihood, and that this. Well, this is why in my uh, this is why what I did I had two k I had to think about it as levels of outliers. We had extreme outliers. Those are the ones that jump two stages. So basically, they are either assigned a high risk, and the predicted value was low risk, like those three fraud cases, or they were medium or they were low risk and they were assigned a high risk. So it's the other way around. So basically, w those are the cases where we consider them as extreme outliers. In this particular example, you say you're simply saying that, y I mean, it's 0 0.00086, which is to me it's like 0.86%. I'm not saying, I'm not uh, saying directly that this is it. What would be an exceptional exception would be, for example, after I have ranked all the cases, they, you would see at that point the differences between the judgment of the auditor, the auditor's judgment, and the model. This one, again, it depends on the remaining ones. It's a relative number. It's not a threshold. It's relative to all the cases that you have. So again, let's like for example, you look at the second record, and you calculate those ratio. You see how far of the auditor's judgment was. Then you compare the two of them. Here, I'm not saying that this one is right and this one is wrong or vice versa. I'm simply saying that here, the difference is like 25, 21.5%. Here, it's like 5.7%. Which one would you look at first? Simply like, as simple as that. I'm ranking all of them. So I did that for all the records that we had, each one of them. And then you look at it. Whenever you have a difference of zero, it means that this is not an outlier at all. The expected, va the assigned value and the expected value are the same. But when you look at it, and you see that there is one of them, the first one on top, has a difference of 21.5%. The second one has a difference of 0.05%. Which one do you think is more suspicious? I would say the first one. This is all I'm saying. No, it's not. For the second one is close. I, I agree with you, but the second one is closer. So this is the point. Which one is closer? Let's say that you had the you had the means to investigate one of those two cases. Which one would you look at? The one where it was 40 to 60, or the one where it was 53 to 47? Yes, oh, you we had those. We had some of them that were. Oh yeah, but let's say that you. S no, it's not necessarily. Not necessarily. It could be under documentation. Not necessarily. It could be under documentation at this point. We looked. At, we looked at both actually. No, we looked at both. We didn't give it any loss. My, I don't know. We didn't give it any loss function at this point. We're simply saying that provide an explanation of why you chose the lower percentage and not the higher percentage. No, it's not a problem. And again, we're not saying that it's a problem. But at that point, once you have, like I had ranked all these for, for external auditors, okay, for the, I'm sorry, for the internal auditors part. I ranked all the 900 ones, and I looked at them. Many of them, even the ones that are. Yeah, 
Yeah. One, one where you have, one where you have, okay, so one where you have a difference of 40 or 50 percent, or one where you have a 5 percent difference. Even, on which one? No, not necessarily. But either way, actually we had a lot of cases, most of the time, like for business owners, they had under, uh, they had basically overseated their risk. Probably they don't want to have any bad surprises. Yes, yeah. it's still, it's not, the, it's not the correct assessment. Why? This is, the, this is what we're saying, provide an explanation. Did you miss to, basically did you fail to mention, a to document a certain thing that the management did? Were they, for example, trying to fix this issue and you did not mention it? This is still under documentation. You have to document it. Yeah, this is, why, this is what we noticed actually, this is what we found. But at this time, let's say that you had, we had 900 cases, and we only have the possibility of, ex of examining 20 of them. Which ones are you going to look at? Ones where you have, because you are going to look at some of them anyways. It's not like you were taking all of them for granted. You are still going to we uh, look at the management's evaluation or the internal uh, or the internal auditor's evaluation you are going to examine the their judgment so it's not that you're not going to do any of these but which ones are you going to take a random sample where you might have the same ones all the time or are you going to use a more mm, let's say a better informed one where the difference between Yeah, and you always have. Yeah. Because those are two different things that you're talking about. This is one of them is about the actual audit. No, but you have to do both. One of them is where you're looking at the, uh, you are required to report on the adequacy of your control system. This is different from actually working to fix an issue that is already there. So those are two different things. It's not one, you cannot do one and ignore the other. You have to do both. you would have a difference of zero and a ratio of one, which is to mean it's, com it's the same as the expected value. It's not that they should say, so that's what they did. this is m based, on the mul based on the historic data, that's what they did. It's not what that's what they should. Again, it's not should. That's what they did. So basically, if they did, so you mean next year, for example? No, but this is, it has to be adjusted every year. Okay. Well, uh, that they are, that be no, not always, because there are certain cases that are clear to everyone. Because for this one, it is also it's only two major cases, uh, major uh, issues. Just to throw in, whenever we had a critical, whenever we had a critical issue, we always had 100% of the auditors who assigned a high risk. Yeah. So what we're just looking at is the, the one that has a higher probability, and then we can do that calculation. So you should get a balance. The question is, if you're not getting a balance, 
No, not always. You shouldn't always get 50-50. It depends on the cases that you have. Even 40-60. No, actually, most of the time, they were like 95 to 5, like the second one. No, not the second one, I'm sorry. Like, uh, I didn't include all of them here, but if you look at them, you have many cases where you have, for example, uh, actually, it's not many. It's like the top, uh, top from those exceptions, the top 10% of those exceptions. This is why I call them exceptional exceptions because the top ones are actually very close. They are in the like 90 to 10 or 95 to 5%. Still, why did those 5% assign it a high risk or low risk? Okay. Did I, did it, sorry, did I answer your question? Uh, okay. Which one? This is based. This is basically like here. You have 15% of the time, 1.5% uh, of the time, 52 and yeah. Point point 0.15%. The other ones are. This is you have a bunch of auditors who had found one major issue and one non-major issue. Let's say that in this case we had. Let's say that we had another case here, one, two, three, four, five, eight. This is for one auditor. But those calculated values are not for one auditor. Let's say that here we had one critical and one major and zero here. Let's say, give it this one. At this point, you are most likely to find something in the, something where like you would have, for example, this is 0.95 or 97, and this is 0 0.5, 0 0.05, sorry, 0 0.05. At this point, if the auditor has assigned it a medium risk, you would say, okay, so why? Five per only 5% 5 of the auditors assigned it a medium risk. Michael, this is, what you, yeah, this is the example that you're thinking about, right? Where you have 95% compared to 5%. That would be more of an exceptional exception, right? And this is actually, what the ones that the auditors actually looked at, Dave and the uh, like internal audit department, they looked at the ones that had a high, really high difference. The difference here is like 90%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that would also require that you would know more about the issues, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't have the proportion. That's the thing. But this is uh, this is what I did here. This is what I did here. I I looked at all. No, 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 no. I I looked at all the cases that had one and one. And at that point, we have 52% of them, or 53% of those people who had, uh, who basically who audited one and one, and 53% of them they said that this is a medium risk. Yes. No, those are not the actual. But those are based. Those are based on. Those numbers are based on the answers of all. Model. Yes. No, actually, not just the P. I had fitted model and a predictive model. The fitted model I included the same year as well. Yeah, we had one and one, and it was, for example, uh, a medium risk. Oh yeah. Yes. So we did have cases where we have one and one. What if they are all me? Why? No, no, but my model will, but my model it has predicted 53% because the auditors in the previous year or in the previous, in that year. You mean 100 in this year, whereas in the previous year they were different? Now this is what he's saying.
Okay. Yeah. Why? You, 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 oh, I see what you mean. You mean if this is for the predictive model. This is when I'm using previous years, and what if this year has changed? And we did see actually an improvement in, in, predict, in the predictive power of the, uh, on the predictive power of, not of the model, of the business owners. It seemed that they learned with time how to use the tool better. So they had started to have a better uh, risk assessment. So you started to have less and less differences. But you still had like 25% of the time where you have differences, even with the fitted model. The fitted model is where I use the three years to train the model, the three years to test the model. You still had. So basically, that was a detective way. So even if you look at it from a detective perspective, just to try and detect those differences, we still had all these. Even when you had, we had certain cases where it was the same all the time. If you have, for example, zero, 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 you expect it to be all the time as low risk. But in reality, if you look at this table, they were not. So those are the numbers that were actually found. And this is, if you want to look at this, this is the fitted model. And fitted, it means I used all the data. So even if someone has changed, even if the people changed during that year, well, I'm using the same data. What Definitely. Definitely, it's not the same. And this is to go back to his point that what about each process, how many controls they have? And I totally agree with you, but I don't have this information. Unfortunately, but unfortunately, we don't have this information. It would have, it would have, exactly. But even with that, you would see that certain case, many, most of the time, like almost here, if you look at those ones, you have like 83% of the time with the fitted model that they were consistent. They systematically assigned the risk. Those 17% of the times were different. This is for internal auditors. 17% of the time they were different. Actually, I cross check them. Okay. The ratio and the difference, you mean? No, the, he, here, 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 I did not do the ranking yet. At this point, we did not do the ranking. No, at this point, it's simply is it the same or different? This one, both of them are different. The predicted value was high here, the predicted value was high. Signed value was medium. That's different. Yes. The second case also. Now, which one are you going to look at as auditor? Which one are you going to investigate more of first? The one that has a bigger difference, the one where the difference between the auditor's judgment and the value, basically the expected value is 5%, like the second one here. This is 5%. What simply this means is that 53% of the time, or 53% of auditors would have given it a medium risk, as opposed to 47% who had given it a low risk. This is practically 50-50. At this point, as, inter as head of internal auditor, would you investigate this case? No. You wouldn't even consider it as an outlier. So the system has so the system has actually, the system has actually identified it as an exception, simply because, simply because it was not the expected value. But how serious is it? It's not that serious because uh, 53 to, 40 to 47 is very close. The second one is basically 60 to 40. 60 said that it was high. 40 said it was medium. If you were, well, I'm sorry now, which is what I just made it easier. Okay, let's see. 
Now at this point, which one would you look at? Let's say that you are the head of internal auditor and you are going to examine one of them. Which one are you going to look at? You're going to look at the first one. That's the only thing that I'm saying. Rather than simply picking one of them randomly, well, one of them was very close compared to the other one. That's the point of the whole thing. And this is when we rank them actually, we notice that, more, m that the top 20 were actually the suspicious ones in that they were very different compared to the remaining ones. The remaining ones, although we had, like you see here, you have here 25%, 24% basically. You have 24% of the time they are different. But those 24% of the time, they are not actually that different. They were many, most of them, they were, like we said, 47 to 53. So it is safe to not investigate them compared to those ones, like this one here. We had 1.76% of the time. This one here, those were fraud cases. Those were actually fraud cases. They had zero, zero issues. So as expected, you would expect that the value of this, or the risk level of this process to be a low risk. Yet the auditors had assigned it, the auditor had assigned it a, mid, a, a, a high risk. So this is what we call an extreme outlier. Those ones in the middle here, those are the normal cases. The value or the judgment of the auditor is the same as the judgment, uh, as the predicted value of, this, of the model. So they did not change anything here. Those four here, there was some change. And as you can see, the highest percentage was always for the cases where the system, the, the, the model predicted it to be high risk, but the auditors, they assigned it a medium risk. Why? And according to the internal audit department, like the head of the internal audit department, he was telling us that most of the time, they either found something that, for example, the management are trying to fix it, uh, they cut them some slack, they know the manager he is a good guy and is trying to do to fix it, etc., etc., blah, blah, blah. Or simply because they are afraid of putting like high risk. It's like the distance between low risk to medium risk and medium to high, it's not the same. When you say that this is a high risk process, maybe it will increase the level of work that they have to do to the point where they don't want to do that. And again, that was just speculation on his, uh, on his side. We have no information, no facts on why this happened. We simply see that this is different, Christine. This one here, you this one here? that they use their judgment correctly. All we're saying here is that at this point, you're not saying that the auditor is, that the expected value is better than the auditor. Actually, we're saying the different. We're saying differently. What we're saying is that the auditor's judgment is of higher quality, but what happens is that at this point, you might want to ask for explanation. Why do you have this case? Whether you are the head of internal audit department and you see, see that, you're, that your auditor assigned a high risk to a case where they officially s found no issues, or whether you are an external auditor and you're trying to look at how the company is assessing or evaluating their internal controls, at this point you need to see, why did you do this? Just ask for explanation, and this is all we're saying. We're not saying that this is actually, the model is, su is supposed to replace the auditor's judgment. We're simply saying this, this model, which was based, which was built based on the auditor's judgment, it would show what the majority of the auditors would say. It's simple here if we say, for example, how many of you like, uh, b believe that it's time to take a break? If one of us say that, no, we don't wanna take a break, and the remaining people wanna take a break, then at this point, simply asking them, why don't you want to take a break? And this person might tell us that, for example, I want to go back home early. 
So they might have an explanation. We're simply saying that this is different. It doesn't mean that one is better than the other. That's not the claim, and we don't claim to, to, say, to do that. It's not that this is accuracy and this point. It doesn't really mean that this is the only correct one. Weights. Feedback is always required to improve and fine tune the model. And I think we'll talk about the next paper, which we'll discuss. Do you guys want to have a break? Okay. Unanimously. Okay. So let's have a break. But to answer your question, that was the other uh, paper, which we'll cover after that one.